All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Oh, thank you, Memo. All right, so I got a uh, fun topic for you all today. We're going to be talking about leveling up your machine learning workflows. So I gave a talk earlier in the conference on how to make sense of machine learning, targeted more towards uh, getting started with it. What does this mean for you? How can you go back to your organization and have tangible next steps to actually start performing machine learning? So uh, just a quick show of hands. Who is at a company currently that has machine learning deployed? Either as an API, uh, their own services they've rolled in-house? OK, cool. So a good number of you. That'll, that'll help uh, with, with God in my talk. I think we should be good now, yeah? All right, sweet. Great. So again, I'm Nick Walsh. This is uh, leveling up your machine learning workflows. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a technical evangelist at AWS. I have the unique honor of getting to be here and teach you fellow developers um, all sorts of awesome things and to help empower you using AWS's services. I'm super passionate about AI and machine learning. Uh, I've worked in it pretty extensively in my past roles. Uh, and before I helped you write code to spin up infrastructure, I wrote code that did everything from analyzing human brains, uh, eggs, and sharks. So I uh, was big in the biospace back in the day. <laughs> but um, in addition to that, I get to host live shows with developer-oriented content on uh, the AWS channel that's actually getting streamed on the right now, as well as my own personal channel. So if you're in any way interested in live video content for developers, check us out. And uh, I've worked at some cool companies in the past that have um, done work in the AIML space. And as always, comments, criticism, and anything in between is always welcome on Twitter. So let's give a quick roadmap of what we're going to talk about in today's talk. So first, we're going to talk about AI pipelines in the wild. Every company has a different pipeline, but I have a bit of a calculus for helping you figure out where you fall into place. Uh, the world of machine learning is a bit more structured when it comes to what companies settle on with respect to pipelines, and I want to share that with you. And I'm going to do that and help you figure out, based on that, how to improve your pipeline. Then after that, I'm going to give you advice that you may not use right away, but you'll be using down the line when you're going to be figuring out, when am I hitting the end of this tier that I'm in, and what will I need, or what will that moment be that I'll have to make the jump to the next level of services? And I know a lot of that is very vague, but uh, over the course of this talk, you'll, you'll get to learn a little bit more about what that means. So first, really quickly, uh, this was one of the big takeaways from my prior talk when I was explaining machine learning, but to all, many of you, this should be very familiar. So the machine learning process in three steps, at the, at the core of it, you have to define a problem statement. You have some sort of parameter you're optimizing for. And this drives the decision of what algorithm you're going to use. You may have data already, but if you have a specific question in mind that you want to solve, you may need to go out and get the data to solve that. And so as a result of feeding that data that you have into your algorithm, you will have a model as an output. And now machine learning does not provide value to your business until you're actually using that model to perform predictions. We call this inference. Uh, and so using that model, you build a microservice that can perform inference. Hopefully, it's scalable. Um, and you use that to whatever capacity your application needs, either an endpoint that operates internally, or maybe you make a machine learning model that operates externally as a service. But this is really the core of machine learning. So I just said this, but business value is achieved during inference time. And if any of you have ever tried to justify budget, uh, it, Machine learning can seem like it has a very large hump to get over with respect to collecting the data, with respect to uh, performing the training, which can seem like a very big deal. But in reality, not only is the, the value delivered during inference time, so you need to go from zero to one in order to uh, actually start getting value from your experiments, um, but ultimately in the long term, your training becomes a small sunk cost. If you're using machine learning at scale, inference will very quickly balloon and become the larger cost when compared to training. So it's very important to focus on that. And so training is still necessary. It still fits the, the paradigm I described before. But depending on the level of abstraction that your company is taking with respect to AI and ML, it may just not have to be managed by you. And sometimes that's OK, and I would recommend it. Uh, and we'll, we'll go into what those examples look like. So first, uh, there's, there's two main parts of the AI pipeline. And the level of abstraction you'll choose uh, will dictate what tier you're going to fall in later uh, with respect to uh, system design and architecture paradigm. So first part is training. Here are steps that uh, essentially take you from end to end with training. Now, many of you may not do some of these. And, and you'll see yourself represented later on in the slide deck. But this is what it, what, what it will take to go from data in some form, we're, we're considering that's the entry point, right? You have data, you're storing it somewhere, to ultimately having a validated model that you want to go and, and send into inference, which is the next part. So each of these steps, again, probably pretty familiar, but we'll go through them really quickly. You collect the data for later access. If it's a lot of data, you may need some sort of personalized ETL, extract, transform, load pipeline. 
uh, especially if you have a huge amounts of data that you need to feed into an algorithm or perform transformations and cleaning on. Then you're going to have pre-processing, where you've selected what algorithm you want to use or, or you know what format you need your data to be in to start wrangling with. Uh, and so pre-processing, for example, if you use Python, that's probably going to be PySpark uh, or tie into the ETL there. Or uh, NumPy, Pandas. These are libraries we're all used to working with, uh, and you know them inside and out. You want to be able to transform that data such that it can plug into the algorithm, which leads right into training. When you plug your data, you run it through the algorithm, it's going to output a model. That's, that's, that's gold. That's the golden egg. That's what you want. And then maybe you're running a bunch of experiments in parallel. Maybe that's your first experiment. You want to go back, make some changes. So this isn't exactly linear. And all of you probably know this. You know, you've, you've, you've trained your first model. Something went terribly wrong, or it's not accurate enough. You go back and you do it again. You may run many experiments in parallel. You may do hyperparameter optimization. All of this falls under training. And so these are the tools that you're used to using every day. And so data lakes and wa databases, warehouses on the data side, ETL, I mentioned uh, Spark, but you know, MapReduce, Hadoop, depending on what your com company's existing maturity level is for your data pipeline, some systems may already have uh, uh, different tools. You may not get to choose, right? We think it's extremely important to build pipeline, uh, to build tools for you that meet you where you're at. We're not in this to convince you to use a new tool. We want to build tools that augment your existing workflow. With pre-processing, we build SDKs that are available to work in the languages and, and use the libraries you already know and love. And on the training side, we know that you're using language level frameworks like TensorFlow, like PyTorch. You want to continue to use those. And so we, we meet you there and we build and optimize those algorithms. But I'll talk more about that later. Next up, inference. Uh, this is one of the biggest ones. And I think that there is a lot of information out there on the training side. But I think that inference is one of the less publicly talked about ones with respect to scaling. There are a handful of companies that have to deal with this at insane scale, uh, examples being uh, for, for internal use, Amazon, Google, Uber, Facebook, et cetera. These are data science and AI first companies. And they have had to deal with this problem at an unprecedented scale. But this isn't obvious, and it doesn't always come out in tech talks for how the public can follow in their footsteps. So here we see all these, these steps, deploying that model that we had before. A model is just a static file. It's just a bunch of numbers. It's weights. You need to wrap that as a microservice. And then the frameworks make that really easy to do, but you still need to do that. The, the, the static file doesn't just perform prediction on its own as much as we all wish it could. You have data ingestion, right? So you have a function, but how are you piping the data into it, right? There's a, a million different ways you can do that. Then once you have the data, do I need to pre-process it? Is it coming from one source? Is it many sources? What sort of uh, like linting or, or uh, filtering do I need to do on this data? Then finally, you get to perform your prediction. And then once that prediction's made, where does it have to get served to? Is it uh, the end of an API response? And then you send that right back to whatever called uh, your microservice? Are you outputting a uh, entry in a database? Are you putting it to a static file? All of these things have to be considered. And if your company doesn't need to do all of them, that's still OK. But it's important to understand that they don't go away. They're just abstracted in other services. And so this is important not in the immediate future, but when you want to level up and go into the deeper levels, having an understanding of what's next will help you ask the right questions to be able to do this. So the technologies for this, uh, a lot of these should be straightforward, but I'm going to show you ex specific examples of how to use this using AWS services that will make your life extremely easy, save you a lot of money, and make your data scientists and machine learning practitioners extremely time efficient, which is one of the biggest sources of inefficiency in machine learning today. So again, some of this I've used pretty fairly standard language with respect to the names of the technologies, but I'm going to go into the specific services in a bit. So it's important to understand that every single customer leverages machine learning at a different level of abstraction. So your organization may only use an API. And so the only interface point that you had to worry about in both training and inference is um, in sending, sending the API request with the payload to the model. The model of the API as a service is handling the pre-processing. It's handling the post-processing. It doesn't even think about training. That's already been handled for you. So you still fit into that pipeline no matter where you are. Um, but we're going to talk about how, how you can think to expand and trip, tips you can use no matter where you are in the existing pipeline. With machine learning, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And this is for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of the biggest pain points of machine learning is that there is uh, a lot of academic uh, phrasing in, in the education around it, right? Like, software engineers can be amazing at writing bug free code, but that doesn't always translate into being able to read PhD level papers for state of the art performance on machine learning algorithms. And so, education is a huge gap. But there's a lot of factors beyond that. So, let's look at the ones that you, know, you probably face very directly. These are, these are very obvious. Latency. How quickly does this prediction need to be served? 
Is someone uploading a picture that needs to instantly have its text read? You have a very low latency uh, situation there. Maybe you want that connection to be done on the edge instead of on the cloud. Um, maybe you are, you are doing a nightly analytics uh, sweep, basically, of your database for the day. That has, a no, uh, that has really like a very high latency tolerance. So you can take steps to actually optimize around that workflow to save a lot of money in that instance. Next is cost. Obviously, if cost is prohibitive in certain ways, you may be able to alter your, it's, it's not binary, right? It's not, can I use machine learning or can I not? There are ways where you can run a model, you can train a model for three weeks and get 95% accuracy. Or you could train it maybe in a day for your use case and get up to 90%. And maybe that instance is a sufficient trade-off of accuracy to cost, and that will work for your business use case. But again, every company has a different permutation of all of these. Scalability also, right? Is this an internal service that's just going to satisfy a few teams' internal products? Or is this something that's scaling out, like, like Uber that uses this to do predictions every single time you open the app? These are all things that make you question how you're going to, to architect your uh, application. And next is customizability. So you, you think you, na you name your business problem. You think you found maybe an API that works for it. But what does that look like in the long term? Are you going to collect more data? Are you going to want to answer more questions that may not be answered by that API? Will your company needs change? These are all things to consider, and they will ultimately dictate what solution you choose for machine learning. So those are the, those are the hard stops, right? Like we have a specific budget constraint. We either um, have the latency requirement or we don't. But then there's some soft, uh, soft blockers, too, that you need to consider. Employee skill set. Obviously, we don't expect everyone to be PhD research scientists, because it's not realistic. We know that our customers, we talk to them. That's not where they are out in the world. Some of them are like that, and we have services for them. But we believe it's important to build services and options for every type of customer. So depending on what your employee skill set is, we have a uh, machine learning option tailored towards that. Agility requirements. So much like customizability, wh what will the, the needs of this model change content-wise? How quickly do you need to update it? Is this a model that you're going to build once and then just have uh, to serve forever, like your problem is finite, it's solved? Or is this a model that you constantly want to update on, on frequent purchases for, or frequent data updates, right? So for example, with e-commerce sites, you always want your model to serve up-to-date recommendations. So you want to ingest data and update that model very quickly. And then lastly, foundational infrastructure. A lot of you, especially ones that are at uh, older companies, will have existing infrastructure that you have to work around. So particularly your data lakes or the databases of choice. You don't have the choice to be able to reset those. So it comes down to, will this new tool that I want to plug into my system be compatible with the existing tools or the existing data maturity level that my company exhibits? And if it doesn't, can I, can I remedy that? OK, so that's a lot of background on AI pipelines in general. And I, I guarantee you, you're all like, Nick, uh, just tell me how I can save money using TensorFlow. Nick, how do I scale infinitely, right? I, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. So these factors, they create archetypes with respect to how customers play out. I, I talk to lots of customers. We, we all do at AWS. And so I find them falling into four main buckets. And, and these are not the buckets themselves, but the reasons why this happens specifically in ML in, in a slightly different way from traditional software. So the first that ML education is largely quantized. What I mean by that is there is not a great level of granularity to learn gradually in machine learning. You have the self-learner or, or someone who learned at a boot camp. They learned a certain amount of information. Or maybe someone who did a master's degree or has experience deploying an application, and, and they've, they've dug a little bit deeper at a company. And then maybe you have PhDs and research scientists. Those are worlds apart with respect to machine learning expertise. But ultimately, they're all machine learning practitioners and users just in different ways. And so because we don't see this gradual distribution of knowledge throughout that gap, the tools are also then, as a result, going to be purpose-built for those very niche customers. Uh, and so that only serves to sort of uh, perpetuate that same problem. Next is that uh, jumping abstraction levels can be difficult, right? It's easy to say, OK, my developers know APIs. It's their bread and butter. So if we can match this business use case to this API, we're golden. But going to the next level isn't just a matter of learning one small thing. It's a matter of learning a lot of different things. And this is extremely intimidating and, and difficult. Uh, so this is also why we see people falling into buckets. And lastly, machine learning services are a two-axis problem. In software, it, it's typically. Um, you just have the complexity of the software problem. I say just. I'm not trying to generalize. But ultimately, it is like you have traditional computer science problems. Now, you take all of those, and they apply to machine learning, and you have another axis of unique problems specific to AI and ML where all of the productivity and deployment and CI CD tools that have already existed for software that have taken so long to build don't really solve the last mile problems in AI. So now you're not just deciding, like, all right, is this a hard technical problem from a software perspective? You have to match that expertise with the machine learning expertise. So it becomes a mess really, really quickly. 
So, based on my observations, this is what I believe the archetypes are for the machine learning pipelines out in the wild at companies just like all of yours. First, the software as a service or the API-centric model. Highest level of abstraction, you, you, you have a relationship with the vendor of, of the API where you do not have to have any machine learning expertise. You are ingesting that, that, uh, that you are passing in data and ingesting the results. That's it. They handle the ops, they handle the scaling, they handle the, and you pay per request typically, or I don't know, computation time, it depends. Next is plugging data into existing training and deployment flows. So let's say a company did research, you couldn't find an API that worked for you, or you've moved on for a new business use case. You now need to start leveraging algorithms to train models. And now, we're not asking you to be research scientists here, but we see that there are a large enough number of open source examples, tutorials, and similar use cases that exist out there such that you feel confident to plug your data into an algorithm, follow a workflow guide, and be able to actually achieve your own machine learning pipeline, at least a very basic version of it that solves your problem. And that's, that's a really large group of people. Next, we have the heavy experimenters. Typically, people move from two to three, um, whereas people, some, some companies that stay, uh, start with APIs end up staying there. So after a lot of experimentation, you find out ways to optimize your workflow. You may have multiple models that train. You may have versioning constraints or, or a very nuanced type of deployments. Uh, with, res with respect to all of that, you need to learn a whole new set of skills and apply those CICD principles I explained, but learn them in the context of machine learning. And we have a lot of features that can help with that. And last is the fully custom stack. This is, you achieve all of the benefit of working as close to the metal as possible. But you're probably running things that, or running framework versions, or you're trying to deploy at scales that are unprecedented, where software solutions start to break down, and you need to start rolling your own. These are the ones that I've described at you know, those major companies I said before. And those, unfortunately, the solutions they've built out internally are not available to the public. That's why we've built SageMaker and some other things that I'm excited to talk about. So we see these archetypes. But it's important to put into perspective. So our mission at AWS is we are fanatical about customer choice, um, and we are customer obsessed. And so I just named all these different types of customers that exist out there, and we have the task of putting machine learning in the hands of every one of them. So you can take my word for it, or you can look at all the customers we have. And I can happily say that more machine learning happens on AWS than anywhere else. Uh, we have 10, over 10,000 customers of our machine learning services across the stack. We have two times the number of customer references, so you can directly see what, the, what is working for them, the improvements they've gotten. And lastly, TensorFlow, one of the most popular frameworks for running machine learning. 85% of those workloads run on AWS. OK, so I, I went across the stack in one of my prior talks at Collision here. Um, but th this is the full offering of the Amazon ML stack from top to bottom. So quickly, uh, to give a quick rundown of this, at the top level, we have the AI services. These are the APIs. So essentially, you, you, I, I will talk in depth about what the abstraction levels are for each of these. But very quickly, the AI services are pay per, per API call or per 1,000 API calls. Your team needs no machine learning knowledge. If your business use case, in terms of the data you have and the insights you want from it, fit one of these services, that is all that you need. You just have to be able to query an endpoint. We handle the scaling. We handle everything else. And we're actually consistently updating those models under the hood. So when you pay for one of those APIs, you're not just paying for the results you're getting now. You're paying for the research scientist at AWS that's improving that service and making it more accurate for you going forward. Very powerful. Uh, to name a few of them, because I'm not going into really like customer use cases for them. Recognition for computer vision for both images and video. Extremely powerful. You pass pictures or videos, it can get you facial detection. It can give you uh, labels of things in the image. Uh, extremely powerful. Textract. Uh, OCR, optical character recognition, a very difficult problem. There are lots of open source libraries, like Tesseract, for example. I've worked with them directly in previous lines of work. And uh, they're good, and, and they've, they've come a very long way. But ultimately, they, they're very focused on just doing one thing, which is pulling the letters and the words off the page and numbers. But ultimately, we realize that business use cases are more nuanced than that. When you get that result, you still have to write a bunch of regex to be able to parse that into whatever fragile way you're trying to uh, you have your forms in. And so that's really brittle. That's not sustainable. You don't want that. Anytime you have a new form, you don't have to like, write new code to analyze that. So we built TextTrack, a purpose-built OCR solution that will actually take forms and like, a printout of a table. And it actually intelligently analyzes that piece of paper and will return structured JSON content as a response. It's crazy. Uh, it's a huge step up from open source and out-of-the-box OCR programs. For speech, we have text-to-speech with Poly, voice-to-text. We have both batch processing and stream processing, so you can translate in real time. Uh, or you can translate as well as uh, transcribe, which is the service for speech, uh, and comprehend if you want to get the sentiment of text. So angry, uh, neutral, 
uh, happy. These are things that uh, are extremely valuable for business insights. We have Chatbot Program Lex, super amazing. You can build this to improve your customer, use, uh, customer interactions, automate them, reduce calls to your call centers, uh, forecast for time series data prediction, and personalize, which is the, like the uh, personal recommendation engines that serve you product suggestions on Amazon, like the service recommendations from Netflix after your episode finishes. You can have that by plugging in your existing customer data and don't have to worry about training. You just have to provide historical data, and the service will respond with uh, nuanced and proper recommendations for your customer. Extremely powerful. Sorry, one second. So before I go into the other ones, I figure we'll, we'll actually dive a little bit deeper and see what, what the AI services look like. So this is the first archetype, SaaS or AI services. Typically, you have no machine learning talent in-house, nor has your company decided that at this point in time, it is a worthwhile investment for you. You're probably running a pilot first before you've even considered whether machine learning is something your organization wants to commit to in the long term. And the, AI, the way AI services are architected from AWS makes this perfect. There's no logistical like, uh, legwork in terms of getting it set up. It's just an endpoint. So you can query it with a bunch of pictures or your data for whatever service you need and see with a gut, with a gut check, hey, is this like right for me? Is, it, is this worth exploring? Next, it's fully managed and hosted. So if it is, you don't have to manage how that ever scales. You just have to manage your own application code. And whenever you're sending out a request to uh, one of our APIs, we can guarantee that based on our SLAs, you will have the proper latency. You will have the proper response times. It will be accurate. It will not go down. No ops to manage. Obviously, everyone loves that. It makes it easier. Less calls and pages in the middle of the night. And the models are built by experts, iteratively improved. We look at all of our customer use cases. We see our customers out in the wild, that our solutions architects, that our evangelists like myself are helping. And we see what are the repeatable problems the customers are facing that we see people reinventing the wheel on because there just isn't enough public availability of services. And so that's why we've built these purpose-built solutions. So here in blue are the services that are abstracted away, or the parts of the pipeline in both training and inference. So you don't have to deal with them. So here, all you have to worry about is ingesting the response. Just, just pass an API call, ingest the response. You, you've got everything. Archetype number two. Basic train and deploy. This is where you start getting into building your own model. This is where SageMaker is going to come in. So machine learning services, especially from AWS, that you're going to be looking at here. SageMaker, which I'll dive a little bit deeper in a second. SageMaker hosted notebook instances, which you've, if you've never used a Jupyter notebook, they're amazing. And we have them out of the box with one click now on hosted servers. They do a little bit more than that, too. I'm excited to share. Uh, we have SageMaker Ground Truth. So data labeling is a huge pain. So whoever has had to collect data knows that in order to pass it to a supervised learning algorithm, it needs to be labeled. So if I'm trying to make a shoe classifier, I would need to pass in a bunch of images, and each of them has to be labeled with the brand of shoe that I want the algorithm to use to make this decision boundary. And so, you know, I think every data scientist at one point in time has sat at their desk for a few hours saying, like, yes, no, yes, no, A, B, C, and it's just, it's terrible. It's, it's extremely inefficient. Um, and so, Ground Truth is a, is, is a part of SageMaker in our platform where you can upload images and create a task in a, in a like web client, in a web GUI. And you can essentially pass in a list of emails. It could be people at your company. You can also sign up for Mechanical Turk as a target, which is ultimately like uh, task-based labor as a service for, for tasks like this. And you can just say, OK, here's the task. I want you to look at these images. Here are examples of labels. Label them. And we have this for multiple types of, uh, of classification problems. So you have binary classification. So for example, is there a car in this image? Yes or no. And then the user has to just click yes or no. It's like a game, almost. They just go to a URL, and anyone who you've sent this to can then uh, feed up the, uh, the data automatically. They don't have to understand it. So binary classification, multi-classification, um, bounding boxes. So draw a bounding box around the cars in each of these images. And uh, one that's actually very difficult, typically, semantic segmentation, which is like, OK, so I have this image. And I want to have the exact pixels that represent this object. So, so can you take a brush and essentially go over and color in those pixels? Uh, companies are rolling their own software to perform this labeling, because when you do it often enough, it becomes a huge blocker. This is all available through a GUI that you can deploy to your own company or other, other people out in the wild. Um, that we, ha we have vested part we have uh, approved partners. We have different levels of tiering, depending on what your problem is, if you need domain expertise. You can even get medical images. Uh, categorized by doctors uh, with HIPAA compliant policies. Uh, so we really have something for everyone to help you there. Here what we're looking at, uh, the user may manage the architecture, some of it, but SageMaker handles provisioning it. And the important distinction there is that you need to understand that you need a server for training, 
you need to understand that an endpoint is how I'm going to serve my predictions. But you don't have to know ops code for spinning that up. You don't need to know EC2, Amazon's service, uh, server as a service offering, to be able to do this. You just need to know, OK, hey, SageMaker, I need four instances to train this, because it's going to be a huge long running task. And I'm going to write that. I'm going to say number of instances equals four. Instance type, C4x large. You hit Enter with the train command here, SageMaker.estimator.fit. And in the background, SageMaker will spin up those instances without you having to do anything. It will pipe all of the logs of that event uh, data in real time out to you. It will perform the training. It will parallelize your algorithm. Uh, it will parallelize your training job if your algorithm allows for it, which most of the SageMaker ones do. And it will actually distribute it and, and basically perform the MapReduce and pull it all back onto the host server, which is the Jupyter Notebook. So you just performed distributed training across any number of instances of any type with GPUs without needing to know anything else beyond this function right here. So we know that ops is a big blocker for a lot of machine learning folks. So this, is, this has helped a lot of people. And then ultimately, I mentioned before, you don't get value until you're performing inference. So you can have the best model in the world. You can have 98% accuracy, right? 99% accuracy. But if you can't deploy it as a service and other parts of your application can't use it, it's not providing value. So we have a one-line function for this. If you're building your model in SageMaker, you do SageMaker.deploy, and you pass in the model that you just built, and you have an endpoint. And we have something called Amazon Elastic Inference, which is a box you can check that will say, please scale this endpoint to traffic so that you are never under-provisioned so that when you know, too many people hit it, it's, it's lagging or it goes down. And you're never over-provisioned, because it will only scale up to the demand that you have instantaneously. Again, like the huge software problems that exist in the ops world, uh, the, 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 the existing tools didn't work. But at Amazon, we've built out systems that enable us to do this. So what does this look like when it comes down to brass tacks? Like, what are the actual gains of using SageMaker over just rolling your own uh, frameworks, open source frameworks, on servers? So first is reducing costs. 70% cost reduction for using ground truth. If you are paying a data scientist and they are on your payroll, it is not efficient to have them performing a menial task like data labeling unless there is a specific knowledge need for that to happen. But most of the times, there's not. So 70% of the cost reduction to do that. Next, 75% cost reduction for inference. So typically, you may package your model. You ship it off to your DevOps uh, folks at your team or the team at your company and say, hey, wrap this as an endpoint, put it up for me, scale it, just do whatever you need. By leveraging GPUs under the hood with our infrastructure, we can actually automatically perform the scaling and perform it more effectively than you would be able to if you just rolled your own servers or rolled your own open source variants. But I'll get into the open source part in a second. Next is increased performance. As part of this parallelizability, we have uh, parallelizable, GPU parallelizable variants of a lot of algorithms that enable you to scale with extremely high uh, efficiency, higher than some of the open source equivalents. So the issue with scalability on the training side is always resource utilization. So let's say you have this server and it has 10 GPUs. And you want to make sure that every one of those GPUs is running at 100% so that you're getting the fastest computation time possible. Well, a lot of these open source frameworks, as a function of them being generalizable to work with a lot of uh, different environments, are actually not optimized to work on all of them as well. That's just a general software trade-off. And so as a result, you may only ever see peaking at 70, 80% utilization on a GPU. So you're, you have to scale out more, even though none of those GPUs will go to 100%. It's terrible. It's just inefficiency. And so we enable you to have both more efficient access of, of resource utilization, but also linear scaling. A lot, of, a lot of frameworks will fall off after a certain number of GPUs and not continue to scale linearly. But ours do, to a much higher extent. I mentioned one-click tra training and deployment. You can do it with the, with the SDK, like I said before, the dot .deploy function, or in the console. And train once to run anywhere. It's really cool, but I'll mention it later, because it's more on the full stack side with respect to um, complex deployments. So I mentioned before, 85% of TensorFlow workflows on the cloud are on AWS. So 65% is about the uh, scaling efficiency you will get on individual GPUs due to inefficiencies in how the memory handling and distribution is handled by the open source variant of TensorFlow. This is not to say TensorFlow is bad. This is a trade-off that developers had to make when they make a framework that wants to achieve mass popularity. It, it, you can make it efficient, but you, can, you can't also make it perfectly efficient and perfectly generalizable when you're using inherently different hardware platforms with something that's so close to the hardware. So 65% is around what we can see for utilization at, at large scale out. We optimize TensorFlow under the hood. 
you have the exact same binding. So when you bring TensorFlow code to AWS, your code will run just as it normally does. But you will be using more of each of the GPUs such that you can either uh, achieve one of a few goals. You could use fewer instances or fewer GPUs to achieve the same training time. Or using the same number of GPUs, your models will finish training faster. So it's a win-win. You get to decide which of those that you want. Also, you can feel comfortable and sleep well at night knowing that you're not paying for uh, part of the utilization to just be heating the data center. OK, so SageMaker. It's not an individual service, much like all of the above ones I mentioned for APIs. And there's a reason for that. In this level of abstraction, you truly need an end-to-end -end solution such that you can make trade-offs and assumptions for passing off parts of your workflow uh, along the way. Now, there are open source variants or open source uh, software solutions that try to pick at some of these individual parts of the process. This is actually what my last company did. We tried to pick at individual parts of this. But what we quickly realized is that if every single company is using a different sort of open source variant or each part has different connectors or, or compatibility, the customer is never going to be able to achieve some sort of stable and sustainable pipeline. So this is why we built SageMaker, because we need, customers need an end-to-end -end solution to access all of these efficiencies. So first is pre-built notebooks. Not only do you not have to worry about spinning up a, a, a server and then you know, loading up an AMI or an operating system, installing Jupyter, and so on and so forth, you just want to get started. You, your data scientists use Jupyter Notebooks. Like You can just type Jupyter Notebook in your terminal, and it's up. Well, we make it that easy on the cloud. You go into SageMaker in the console, it's the, it's the website, and you click Hosted Notebooks, you hit Launch. And you don't have to launch a beefy notebook. And I'll get into why that's the case in a sec. You can essentially set up a master-slave configuration where your notebook is like your home base. It will prescribe out to other services and other uh, pieces of infrastructure on how to run your code. And it'll do it really efficiently, such that the only persistent piece of hardware is going to be that notebook. But because you can run it on a small server, it can be very cost effective. Next is algorithm selection. So these are algorithms you know and love. They exist in various forms, some identical across different frameworks. Scikit-learn uh, has many of these. TensorFlow, Keras, they all have bindings for these. Um, some of them use the exact same code under the hood. But again, we go in, we optimize these further. We have the hardware they're all going to run on. We're building the bindings uh, so that we can connect them. So we go all the way down the stack and optimize these so that you can get better performance than the open source variants, but use the code that you already have. So you're not getting locked in. You're, you're using the same code you already have. And any code that you write, you can do whatever you want with down the line. Next is setting up environments. This was exactly what I worked in, and it's, it's hell. Um, like for anyone who's worked in it, both on trying to reproduce training results and deploying. Uh, you know, Everyone says, like, oh, yeah, use Docker, and Docker is one of the foundational technologies that will help solve this problem, but it's easy to say, hey, just learn this massive technology and all the pros and cons that come along with it when your machine learning uh, practitioners are already trying to learn ops and then proper software engineering best practices. So if we can enable this to have one-click deployment or reproducible environments like we do in SageMaker, we know it provides immense value, and it makes it extremely easy to lift and shift when you're going from training to deploying to production. That's why we can enable one-line deployments. Training and tuning, uh, this is a part of like algorithm selection. You go in the experimental process. Hyperparameter optimization is a huge problem, right? So you, you know this is the right algorithm. You know your data set is nice and clean. You know you have the right features. But now you just need to scale out your experimentation process such that you can figure out what the optimal set of hyperparameters are. And the state-of-the-art performance has moved over time. You, know, you can just do a proper grid search. You can do a random search, which at times has shown to be even better. Uh, but how do we optimize that further? How do we make that experience better than running a bunch of nested loops that if it crashes, your, your job just goes out? Well, you can just parallelize all of them. We allow you to do that in SageMaker. Hyperparameters, just pass in lists, pass in arrays, and it'll actually spin all of those jobs up. This is what it looks like. So I have a factorization machine model here used for recommendation engines. It's just imported from SageMaker. And here I'm passing in the data and feature dimensions and the shape of it. I'm telling it the predictor type. It's just one of the many parameters. You can look at the docs. And I'm determining number of factors, epochs. I'm just defining my training job. This is the hyperparameters, right? This is very similar to how you already do it. But this is enabling SageMaker to, to take this and apply a very similar syntax to whatever algorithm you're using under the hood. One-click deployments, I, I talked about this, but I wanted to show you instead. That's what it looks like. After you've, you've taken that, you've defined your hyperparameters, you, you do fm.fit. It will distribute that, perform the training. It'll output your model artifact on S3 or wherever you want it to go. And then once that's done, you can actually just deploy with sagemaker.deploy, or in this case, fm.deploy. You, you, you tell it the instance type you want. You tell it the initial count. It couldn't be any easier. 
Next, scaling and managing the production environment. Obviously, going from zero to one is the, one of the biggest problems in machine learning. But once you're there, you will very quickly realize the next question is, oh, so where's model two going? Where's version two of the first model? How do we scale this out and parallelize it? How do I use more data? Uh, it's the for, everyone thinks it's so far away, but once you deploy that first model, you're, you're going to be right there. Um, so auto-scaling, health checks, automatic handling of node failures, uh, failover redundancy, spinning instances back up. We've solved the problem. Uh, a lot of customers don't see a unique business value of solving it again for themselves. So please, just use the serve. This, this functionality is free as a part of SageMaker. You're still only paying for the compute resources you're using. These features are free to use. You don't pay an additional part to use our SDK. OK, so archetype three. I think I'm, i got to speed up a little bit. But um, we have ML services. So this is after you've deployed that first model. Maybe you've got a bunch. Maybe you need to parallelize them. You're using a lot of the same services you just used, uh, but you're probably getting a little more intimately familiar with them. Maybe your company has expanded your data pipeline and you want to have more sources, so you have to perform more complex ETL. Uh, Amazon Glue, and it, or uh, yeah, Amazon Glue enables you to do that. It uh, enables you to pull in data, perform a transformation on it. It's completely serverless, so you don't have to worry about what instance it lives on. And you basically just say, hey, here's my source. This is what the data is going to come in as. This is the format I want it to be in, and this is the destination. You don't have to worry about a, what framework you're using for ETL, or, or you can roll your own. You know, you, we have PySpark also. We have EMR, Elastic MapReduce, if that's something your company's already used to do or knowledgeable in. And so ultimately, this is just a deeper end-to-end -end integration. So in the prior example, archetype two, you're, you're kind of just plugging your data into an algorithm that you already knew works. This is where maybe your software engineers have, have learned a little bit more about machine learning. You can reason a little bit better about algorithms. Maybe you've hired your first data scientist. These are the services they're going to want to use to be able to unlock that next level of, uh, of value for your company. And pre-processing, obviously, um, it depends on what your service looks like. Before I mentioned an API, but you, know, you may have lots of different ways this can come in. You could have streaming data for your, for your, for your uh, model. What does that look like, right? Like that's something you have to figure out for your company. Is it audio data? Is it pic image data? Is it video data? The, the world is wild out there. But ultimately, you still don't have to worry too much about ingesting it. You're not opening your own API gateway. You're just deploying. So you still don't have to worry about the ops on the endpoint. It's very handy. And lastly, post-processing, like once your model's made a decision as a microservice, you still have to re-serialize whatever that output is and send it back as an API response or send it somewhere. Now, in the function you, you build for pre-processing, you can just define where it wants to go. But again, you don't have to worry that you accidentally messed up your API gateway or that your service is going to shut down. Again, what does this look like when it comes to numbers and cent, uh, dollars and cents? Uh, training on GPU instances with parallelizability on SageMaker is going to achieve um, a lot of performance gains. But more specifically, we have a specific class of instances called spot instances. So most of you are used to using on-demand instances. I say, hey, I want the server. Please spin up now. I know what your rate is going to be. And, and then you spin it down, and then that's the cost you've paid. Now, as the scale we operate at, we can actually sell at a different market rate based on supply and demand at any one point in time servers at a significant discount. So there's a trade-off here. These servers may not be able to live forever, and they may get interrupted, but there are ways to architect your application such that you can train and use these servers for 30 to 50% less than the same exact equivalent on demand. So again, this works for certain workloads. For example, batch processing. You want to do a nightly anal analysis of your data set. It doesn't need to be timely. If it fails, you can have it spin back up on another server and continue. It may be long-running processes, right? These are all ideal for spot instances. And it's literally just a lift and shift from on demand to spot. And then maybe you need to make a few tweaks if you have extremely long running tasks. But 30 to 50% is nothing to scoff at. My coworker, Shashank, he's another evangelist. He works at AI and ML. Uh, he wrote an awesome guide on being able to use GPU training on these spot instances such that you don't have to worry about this system failing. Uh, really great post. You'll get, all be getting the slides after. Uh, so I recommend going to that. So yeah, people are naturally very excited about how much money they save with spot instances. Next, if you do want to roll your own serialization, uh, for example, let's say you have a very specific use case, but you still want to use SageMaker. You can still do that. You don't have to give up all of the benefits SageMaker has to be able to have more control. Again, we're customer choice. We want to make sure you can do what you want. So for example, if you're building this to be a publicly exposed API or in, even a private API that another team or your company is going to use, you can define what that serialization will look like for the response you're going to give. You don't have to worry about dumping it to S3 and then figuring out how the other team's going to ingest it. You can actually write that code and write it directly in SageMaker's notebook such that you have all of that code in one place. You can look at that notebook. It doesn't need to be in, in 10 different places. You, you see here on the bottom, you're defining common parameters for APIs, like what is the, what is the content type, um, what is the deserializer in Python here. It's using the JSON deserializer. 
Next, distributed training. I've talked a lot about this. I've talked about how it scales extremely efficiently. And I have 10x listed as the order of magnitude that this can uh, increase your, your training. But it can honestly be more than that. The, really, the only things you're bottlenecked here by are what is your algorithmic efficiency, how fast you need your model trained, and um, you know, how long is your process to begin with. Because ultimately, and, and like, please excuse me, this is not technology alphabet soup. This is almost like serverless machine learning on the training side. It, it, it's much more apt on the, on the inference side. But essentially, the way you get billed for training, traditionally you spin up EC2 instances. You put your job on it, you run it, it's done, you check it, you SSH in, okay, it's cool, all right, shut it down. You're paying for all of that laggard time on both ends. With SageMaker, when you run that fit function, it provisions the infrastructure, and then once it's launched, it starts the clock, and it has automatically, on spin up time, actually thrown together your job as part of that AMI. It instantly starts running it, and the second it actually errors out or completes, it tears down the infrastructure. You cannot physically beat SageMaker's distributed fit in terms of shutting down your infrastructure efficiently. And the best part is that you don't have to worry about it, right? So you just run it. Like, typically training jobs have to get started in the morning and your data scientist sits around at their desk all day and they're just waiting, all right, did it finish, did it not, did it error? And it takes hours of their time. You can run this at any time of day and not have to worry about that and you're only getting billed for the exact seconds. And it'll actually tell you that at the end of the job. It'll say, um, you know, 180 seconds. And the magic of this is that parallelize as much as you want because you don't get billed on a multiplier for the number of simultaneous instances you spin up. So, for example, if I have one instance and it trains in 100 hours, or I can spin up 10 instances, and let's say it's like perfectly parallelizable, it will train in one-tenth the time. But because the, I have uh, used the same total amount of time in 10 spinning for one-tenth the time and one spinning for 100%, for you get billed the same amount. So you can pay the same amount of money to parallelize it as, as much as you want and pay the same exact amount. It, it's like really, really amazing. Okay, next, reducing training time, automated distributed le machine learning. I talked about this. I mentioned before, you just define as a variable here the number of instances you want, the instance type, and then when you do SageMaker.fit, it just runs it for you. It, it's amazing. Elastic inference, I also mentioned this before. Uh, essentially what this is, is it's, an, it's a GPU accelerator. It's a special device that we've built, t custom built to work with our hardware. And essentially what this does is when, when demand spikes, it can use the GPUs that you don't have to manage. You just check a box in the console and it will accelerate the, the inference process. You don't have to worry about setting that up. You don't have to worry about using an SDK for that. It's just a box you check and you can save up to 75% compared to your traditional GPUs. If you want to learn more about that and the pricing around it uh, for the tiers, you can check it out at that link. OK, last, last one. Um, some of you may be approaching this. This is definitely the smallest bucket out of all of them. Uh, this is the custom stack. This is inherently very broad, because what this means to end up in this stack is that you have faced typically operations, deployment, or infrastructure demands that have not been met or are not generalizable enough to most other people. And so while all those other services that are really optimized, you access cost savings, they're all built on the exact tools you'll get to use here. So none of them are abstracted away. But that means that you have the full customizability to do this. And so what are the instances where it would make sense to move to this? And I'll get to that a little bit later. But the common ones are like, let's say you're using a TensorFlow framework, right? Like they just pushed a new nightly build. And that's not supported on Docker containers yet that are stable. And you want to use that because it's something for your business. Well, you can build your own Docker container and still use SageMaker to be able to make that a really efficient workflow. There's lots of others. You want to deploy at Edge. You want to deploy on IoT. Maybe you have a uh, not persistent internet connection that still needs high la fast latency, like on a farm, right? It doesn't have internet in the middle of a field. You can actually get an Edge device. As long as you have internet to deploy to that device, it'll actually perform inference on Edge. These are things that we're, we're helping to solve out in the wild every single day. And so you may not face it now, but a lot like of warehouses, like we've seen lots of instances where this is the case. <clears throat> I mentioned Glue before, simplifying your ETL process. Really simple. Build your data catalog. This is going to say, what are my sources of data? Then you're going to generate and edit the transformations. You say, what is the format I need to get this data in to make sure that it gets passed in properly to the next service? And then you're going to schedule and run your jobs. It's a serverless. You don't need to spin up servers to perform glue. You just point it at, at different instances as a, as a target to receive and a target to send to. And you trigger an, in, uh, you, you can either manually trigger it or you can set an event trigger, much like Lambdas. So you can say, hey, every night at midnight, please run this ETL job. There's lots of other triggers you can run as well. Next, serverless inference. A lot of people don't think about this, uh, especially in the uh, machine learning world. So AWS Lambda. Who here has heard of Lambda? All right, good, a lot of you. So Lambda, I will go out on a limb and say it's probably one of the most cost-effective ways to run inference should your inference workload fit in the parameters. 
And so there's only a few of them, and Lambda has expanded its capabilities over time such that more and more of your workloads will fit on here. So there's a few things. You only pay for what time you use. Great, that's why Lambda's awesome. Auto scaling, don't manage any ops. Beautiful. But the considerations, time and size. On time, Lambda has a 15 minute timeout. I'm not telling you to run your training on Lambda. I'm telling you, if you have an inference task that can run on a CPU in under 15 minutes, put it on Lambda. You'll never have to scale it. You'll never have to worry about um, you know, it running over on time, any like, inefficiencies and in how you have your sort of configuration aligned. Like, it's always just at the functional level. You just have an inference function. And ultimately, size. So lambdas have a, a particular gigabyte size limit. So if you have a very large architecture for your model, like a large weights file in a neural network, for example, if you have machine learning libraries that you have to import to perform that inference that are very large, or if you have a huge payload, like a huge video, you can still use lambdas uh, in that case, but you have to figure out some smart ways to dice it up uh, such that you fit under those requirements. But again, AWS Lambda, one of the most cost-effective ways to be able to do this. You just have to think if it fits your workflow. Build once, deploy anywhere, SageMaker Neo. Uh, this is extremely valuable. So in the past, all those constraints I just mentioned are what you think about when you start training your model, right? You have to think, OK, well, if my model can only be so large, I can only use certain frameworks, certain libraries, and it really limits what you want to do. And let's say you have a model that's extremely successful, and you, want, you need to replicate it. You need to almost start from scratch and, and rebuild it to each of those platforms. It's essentially completely independent pipelines. SageMaker Neo, by building an end-to-end -end platform, enables you to train once using whatever typical code that you write, like the first way you would mo code your model, not the minified or, or extraneous different ways you would do it. You build it once, and you can deploy it in any number of ways. You can deploy to an edge device. You can deploy that model to a server. You can deploy it anywhere, and it will be able to match a lot of different runtimes, match a lot of different file sizes and constraints you have, all from the same training. So you don't have to think about how your multi-class um, deployment is, or your multi-device or endpoint deployment is going to work when you use SageMaker, SageMaker Neo. It's huge in the IoT space and c computed edge and, and for minifying models. OK, those are a lot of the tips and tricks that I've learned. Um, and I've, I've talked a little bit about how you figure out when you move between tiers. But I've really broken it down to two very specific leaps that you'll take. First. Obvious caveat, I've mentioned it before, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And you may have a different bottleneck that dictates a reason to jump or a reason that you cannot jump uh, with your organization. If you're on the fence about where to start, if you are here at your organization and you don't know um, where to start here, or if you are on the fence about whether you should jump, my advice is start at the higher level of abstraction first. And the reason for this is that by design, none of your work is going to be wasted. So these are not completely independent and separate versions and solutions for machine learning. They are nested dolls of levels of abstraction, such that if you start at the highest level of abstraction, all of that work that your other services are doing to ingest the, the result in a file or in a uh, endpoint will still persist when you move to the lower level. So now you're making your own endpoint, and so you're, you have to do a little bit more work on the back end. But all the work you did to plug that into your application is still going to persist. So start high if you're ever on the fence and go more in depth. So next up, I have the two jumps with these three categories. The first is going to be when an AI service may or may not cut it for you when you're first starting or when you want to move on. The biggest reason why customers have to jump from a prepackaged AI service to building their own model is because the model accuracy is either not sufficient enough for their specific use case, or over time, they've built out a mature data pipeline such that they can actually build their own models and, and be even more accurate than any sort of generalizable solution. Uh, the, the biggest factors there that are going to be helpful to you in the quality of life department, ground truth for labeling, notebooks for getting up to speed and, and orchestrating everything, optimize algorithms so you're going to be running more efficiently than open source variants, and deployment and hosting. So we try to make that leap as, as painless as possible. And then the next one is ultimately traffic scaling and infrastructure. If you have extremely niche needs, or if you have these very specific things that you need that are not generalizable to the higher level uh, abstracted solutions, you have full control. You still have access to those optimized frameworks that we run on our architecture. You have access to Inferentia and FPGAs, which are really efficient hardware that we've developed in-house to be able to optimize your machine learning inference. So I'm running right up against time, but I know this is a lot, and I know that every step in this pathway is asking your company to learn more. But we want to meet you halfway. We have a vested interest in your success, and we want to see you do well. So we have ways we can help. ML Solutions Lab is number one. From brainstorming, if you are interested, come talk to us. We will help you. We will help you figure out this is right for you. Um, we don't need you to come to us with the answers. We can help you walk uh, and arrive there. Custom modeling, training, work side by side with us. We have various levels of support from enterprise support, essays, and so on and so forth, and machine learning training and certification for formal education. So with that, uh, I hope you learned a few things. Hope you can save some money, be more efficient. Thank you. I'm Nick Walsh, and I hope you enjoyed. Hey, Nick, we got a couple of questions from, from Twitch. Cool. 
So one is, uh, what's your recommended uh, resource for someone that's just getting started with machine learning um, on AWS? Yeah, so if you're just getting started with machine learning on AWS, um, it kind of depends. Are you looking to solve a business problem quickly? If that is the case, I would recommend looking at our APIs very quickly. If you are trying to start learning machine learning from scratch and learning how to build models, I would recommend using SageMaker hosted notebooks because you don't have to worry about knowing what one even is. You just click the button. We have kernels and environments built out already, and you can start using all of those frameworks right out of the box with lots of example code on there for, for solving complicated problems. So, And yeah. um, there's another one from SOC02, which is mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend for someone that's just starting out in college or uh -huh. uh, uh, finishing high school and they want to get into data science? Like, what kind of coursework yeah. they should so be looking at? The question again was uh, someone that's uh, just starting out wants to get into data science, what would I recommend? So, uh, it depends on where you want to end up, which is always not an uh, easy question to answer in the beginning. I feel like most people don't know that. Uh, more math is always better to know, um, but I would say find projects and, and skills that excite you and, and set that as your goal post, meet it, start lower than higher, and just keep moving along. Uh, it, it's all iterative, it all builds on one another. So that's my advice. All right, cool. I think we're done. So uh, thank you again, everyone who came out. I know it's late on the third day, but hope you all learned a thing or two. I've got a jet, but I'm available here if you ever want to learn more or uh, if you need the slides. They should be going out to all of you uh, if you signed up with your email at the AWS Dev Theater. If not, again, reach out to me. I'd love to help you out. Thanks again. <laughs>